In Mary Shelley's famous novel Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein attempts to create life out of lifelessness by bringing together different parts of different corpses to create a person, but accidentally ends up creating an entire new form of life. The Frankenstein monster is frustrated and angry about his desire to be accepted and his inability to be accepted in this world. And this is not just the Frankenstein story, but it's the story that we find in 1988 with the birth of the Commission on Presidential Debates. Who is Frankenstein and who is the monster in this story? Well, I have an opinion about this, but let me give you all the information about how this came to be for the debates between George Bush, the Republican Vice President, candidate for President of the United States, versus Michael Dukakis, former governor of Massachusetts, who was the Democratic nominee. The 1988 debates appeared to be like any other, although there was uh, interesting stuff at the first one where Michael Dukakis appeared to grow in size. The candidates are Vice President George Bush, the Republican nominee, Governor Michael Dukakis, the Democratic nominee. So if you watch that clip again, you'll see that Michael Dukakis is uh, significantly shorter than George H.W. Bush. I mean, who isn't George Herbert Walker Bush, I believe, is 6'4". Michael Dukakis is not. But in the stipulation, they built the stage in a way to make the both candidates appear to be the same height. So it really is a funhouse effect. If you look at it, as Michael Dukakis walks to his podium, he gains about maybe six, seven inches in height. The debate appeared normal, but behind the scenes, the debate was anything but normal. It was the first test of the newly formed Commission on Presidential Debates. The commission was formed out of frustration with what the League of Women Voters had done in previous debates. First, there was the insistence on having journalists that they approve of there. Secondly, they could invite anybody they wanted. Remember John Anderson from 1980? Uh, that was a big problem for uh, both the campaigns and for the media to not have the sitting president come. Uh, they, there was a feeling between former party members and people who were invested in having the good debates and the media that something needed to be done. So what ended up happening was both parties wrote the very first memorandum of understanding. This is a document that stipulates what the rules of the debate will be, how much time will be spent on everything, what the colors and the furniture will be made of, and even that the set will be made in a way to make the candidates both appear to be the same height. Everything is in this memorandum of understanding, and this became the standard practice for the commission going forward. This document was presented by the Bush and Dukakis campaigns to the League of Women Voters, who rejected it as straight-up collusion. They were like, we're not going to be dictated. Our event, this is getting us in legal trouble with Section 315. So the League of Women Voters stepped down from hosting the presidential debates. They were already very frustrated after the Mondale-Reagan debates of 84, where both campaigns would not accept journalists that the League of Women Voters wanted to have at the event. That took forever to negotiate the journalistic panel for those uh, 1984 debates. The League of Women Voters stepped away, thinking that their legitimacy had been questioned, that this was straight-up collusion. And what's funny is the League of Women Voters was the only organization between the major media outlets and the two major parties to worry about the legitimacy of these events the entire time from 1976 all the way to 1984. So good on you, League of Women Voters. That's exactly right. Is this an event that's being covered by the media? Is this a debate that is being covered by the media for the benefit of voters, or is this an event that is political theater that is for the benefit of the parties and for the benefit of the media? The Commission on Presidential Debates answers that question in that latter direction, not the first one. So with the Memorandum of Understanding, the Commission is formed, and now they host the debates. They picked up where the League of Women Voters left off, and they hosted the 1988 debates. Those debates are not memorable, except they're the first test of whether the commission would uh, survive FCC challenges and legal challenges to equal time, and whether or not it would work as a debate format. And I think both of them did, except for poor Governor Dukakis, who got this really scorcher of a question from CNN's Bernard Shaw at the second debate. 
By agreement between the candidates, the first question goes to Governor Dukakis. You have two minutes to respond. Governor, if Kitty Dukakis were raped and murdered, would you favor an irrevocable death penalty for the killer? No, I don't, Bernard, and I think you know that I've opposed the death penalty during all of my life. Uh, I don't see any evidence that it's a deterrent, and I think there are better and more effective ways to deal with violent crime. We've done so in my own state, and it's one of the reasons why we have uh, had the biggest drop in crime of any industrial state in America, why we have the lowest murder rate of any industrial state in America. Now, this moment is widely considered a gaffe, very much like Gerald Ford, a big mistake that uh, someone makes in a, in a debate, um, because he seemed robotic. He didn't respond with any emotion or feeling at all to the things that uh, Shaw said had happened to his wife. He just responded with statistics and with uh, the party platform. So this circulated and, and gave uh, voters the concern that maybe Michael Dukakis was not emotional enough, that he wasn't sensitive enough, that he didn't think like them. The most valuable thing about presidential debates, I would say, is that they convey to us a sense of the identity of the candidate. This is the opposite of the feeling that people had in the 19th century, uh, up until the Lincoln-Douglas debates, where then you get a sense of the personality behind the man or behind the ideas or behind the agenda. Uh, the person behind that agenda, the person behind those ideas, isn't really exposed except in presidential debates. And this is an example of it going really wrong for Michael Dukakis. Voters are like, I can't identify with somebody who would respond that robotically to the situation that the person they love most in this life had been raped and murdered. So the evaluation of debates is always up in the air for the They never provide a clear way to understand uh, how to evaluate the debates, debates, who won. And that's going to be a problem going forward for people think of these as explorations of issues and not just moments where candidates can display their identity. What's the personality like there behind these political party ideas, behind these policy ideas? Well, the commission's off to a good start with 1988. In 1992, they're going to make a couple of mistakes. The Commission on Presidential Debates was formed as a Frankenstein's monster, a way to get around the demands of the League of Women Voters and have the event the way the parties wanted that event to be. Uh, whether or not that monster is going to be accepted or whether that monster is going to turn evil or good remains to be seen.